All right, welcome to part three of our GAP lectures, our final look at our time period of 1789 to 1877. We're going to conclude today by looking at the period of 1865 to 1877, the period known as Reconstruction. Um, and of course, this name comes from uh, the end of the war, the end of the Civil War, having to reconstruct the Union, having to put back together the pieces. Um, as you can see on the political cartoon there, uh, you have Lincoln trying to assist with uh, sewing back together the broken pieces of the Union. And so uh, we're going to take a look at Reconstruction. Uh, we're going to take a look at uh, the different ideas about this, the different um, plans that went into place. And ultimately, um, I'm going to make the argument to you by the end of this based on the evidence we see, based on what we know, um, that in 1877, when Reconstruction ends, uh, that the institution of slavery is gone from this nation only in name, um, that the institution of slavery, in fact, persists by a different name and by different methods, uh, but that by 1877, the work done um, by the war, the work done initially after the war to bring about racial equality um, is ended, is put away, is in fact uh, reversed in many cases, um, and leads to a system that we today would refer to as Jim Crow that will persist until the civil rights movement uh, of the 20th century. So let's not get too far ahead of ourselves though. Let's start again. You'll remember uh, last time we covered the Civil War. So here you can see those states in green. Uh, they are the ones that seceded before the fall of Fort Sumter, right? So immediately following the um, election of Lincoln in 1860, um, you can see there the order that they seceded, starting with South Carolina, then Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia. Louisiana and Texas. After Fort Sumter, when Lincoln calls for troops, you can see that Virginia, Arkansas, uh, Tennessee, and North Carolina join the, the uh, secession movement, join the Confederacy. Um, Missouri, Kentucky, and uh, Maryland, Delaware. Um, we didn't talk about these last time, but these are um, pro-slavery states that remain loyal to the Union. They are kind of the neutral zone, uh, if you will, during the war. And then there you have the yellow states were free, free states uh, that fought on the side of the Union during the war. Okay, All of that orange territory uh, is, are just territories that the United States owned. They weren't yet uh, states, but that is what the map looked like uh, at the start of the war. Okay, And at the end of the war, all of those states in green and pink now have to be brought back into the Union. Um, and that is the task of Reconstruction. How do, we, how do we bring them back, right? These states that declared themselves not just like angry, they declared themselves independent. They made themselves foreign nations for a bit, right? They had their own flag, which for whatever reason still continues to fly in this country today. Uh, they had their own constitution. Um, which rightly so, we don't recognize, we don't put on display anywhere. Um, but how do we get them back? So here we go. Again, reminding you that the, the Civil War, 1861 to 1865, the South is defeated, right? Um, and here you can see some just basic statistics, right? So the Union uh, had about 2.9 million men that served in the war, 1.5 million um, enlisted uh, for three-year terms. They had 630,000 uh, casualties, 360,000 killed in action or died of disease, as opposed to the Confederacy, which had 1.2 million men that served. Uh, 800,000 of them enlisted for three-year terms, right? Um, the, the other men coming from conscription, right? Those forced into enlistment. Uh, that is, so this is showing one and a half million volunteered for service under the Union, 800,000 volunteered under the Confederacy. The Confederacy had 340,000 casualties, um, and 250,000 of those were killed in action or died of disease. The rest were wounded, okay? Civil War is over. We talked about this last time. The 13th Amendment gets passed 
uh, in Congress in 1865. It gets ratified in the northern states. Um, and so when the war ends, right, the 13th Amendment is the law of the Union. And it says that slavery is abolished. It's no, there is no more slavery, right? Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States, right? You cannot, uh, you cannot involuntarily uh, hold somebody unless they've been convicted of a crime, right? And that language is going to be very important uh, when we look at the end of this section. Uh, that language is going to be very important to uh, certain laws that get put in place to basically bring about slavery, part two. But that is the 13th Amendment. And so when the war ends, these former slaves, they're no longer slaves, but they are not citizens. They are this nebulous group of people that we have to figure out what to do with, right? You can imagine they are people who were, you know, not literally overnight, but basically overnight they transitioned from being enslaved, having their entire person owned by another individual, their entire life dictated by the demands and the whims of another person, to now they are free, but they have no country, they are not citizens of this nation. They are not citizens of any nation. Most of the slaves in, in the United States have never been to Africa. We cut off the uh, our participation in the African slave trade in 1808. We uh, Most of the slaves in the country at the time uh, were born here. They were naturally born and bred here in the United States. And so they know nothing of any other nation but this, and yet they are not citizens. And so what do we do with them? How do we address this issue? Well, before we can even address that, Lincoln is killed. Five days after Lee surrenders to Grant, Lincoln is shot at the theater. He is shot by a vehemently uh, pro-slavery uh, actor named John Wilkes Booth. Uh, Booth was a very well-known actor at the time. Booth was uh, also a very well-known uh, pro-slavery activist. Um, he uh, kills Lincoln, jumps from the uh, presidential box, viewing box, jumps onto the stage, uh, and runs for it. He's eventually captured, um, but Lincoln, it, for Lincoln, it's too late. Lincoln dies. He succumbs to the, the injuries. Uh, Booth is captured and eventually killed. Right along with the doc, the doctor who uh, fixed up his leg when he he jumped, he broke his leg. The doctor who fixed up his leg is tried uh, and and put to death for treason. Uh, and so now, in in a moment, right, it, it, we five days after we sign this, we we get this major surrender. In this moment, because of the actions of one individual, the president is dead, and we're left with two major problems. Number one, how to restore the southern states to the Union. How are we going to bring them back? Do they get to come back automatically? Is there a punishment? What is what is the deal? And then also, how do you integrate nearly four million newly freed African Americans uh, into the country? Again, they are no longer slaves, but how do you bring them into the nation? What, how, what, what does it look like to make four million people at once free, and then how do you actually move forward? So those are the questions left behind, and that is, those are the questions that we now have to address under this period of Reconstruction. And so immediately we see uh, this new South, right? Uh, Reconstruction is this time period where we are rebuilding and readmitting these states. Uh, again, we, we time it 1865 to 1877, 1865 being the end of the war, 1877 being uh, the when we get to the Compromise of 1877, which we'll look at. But this period, right, this 12-year period, we're going to look at how the states responded. And so, a major player in this process is, is a group uh, called the Freedmen's Bureau, right? This Freedmen's Bureau is a social group. Uh, think of the NAACP, right? Today, uh, these are this is a group that is committed to providing social services, medical, medical care, and education uh, to the freed slaves, 
right? A, a large portion of these members of the Freedmen's Bureau are um, anti-slavery uh, abolitionist whites from the north, as well as uh, freed uh, black individuals from the north that are going down and trying to provide services, medical care, and education uh, to these newly freed slaves throughout the south. When, when Lincoln is killed, his vice president, Andrew Johnson, becomes president. And Johnson doesn't like the Freedmen's Bureau. Johnson uh, himself is not anti-slavery. Johnson is no friend to the slave. Uh, Johnson himself is a southern plantation owner. Um, but Johnson really loves Andrew Johnson. And Andrew Johnson really loves power. And Andrew Johnson's big deal is that he doesn't want the Freedmen's Bureau going around um, and helping people. He wants them to have to come to him. He wants to be the one in charge. And so not only does he want to want to punish uh, the southern states, as we'll see in a moment, but Andrew Johnson believes that the best thing that can happen is that these former slaves could just go and do their own thing, right? He's not convinced that they need to become part of the union. Um, and so initially, he is going to veto the funding to establish the Freedmen's Bureau. Congress is going to override his veto, which, again, we looked at the Constitution last week. Uh, you should be familiar with that process, right? They can override his veto. And they do. And the Freedmen's Bureau comes into existence over his veto. Uh, and it sets this terrible, terrible tone for Reconstruction. Think about it. The president has been assassinated. We now have the vice president in his place. And one of the very first things that happens is that he battles with Congress and he loses. Right? This sets a very dangerous tone for Reconstruction. Go ahead, take a moment, pause this video. In your notes, I want you to make this chart for yourself because I want you to be able to keep track of the three different plans for reconstruction that we're going to look at. Okay, so pause the video, make this chart, and then we're going to keep going. Okay, so like the chart shows, the first thing we're going to look at is Lincoln's plan, right? We know what Lincoln's plan for reconstruction was uh, in part, right? We have documents prior to his death of what his plan, what he was thinking would be the plan for readmitting states. We're then going to look at Johnson's plan, which is known as presidential reconstruction. Uh, and finally, we will look at the con at congressional reconstruction, which is the plan of the radical Republicans. Okay, so here we go. Lincoln's plan. His plan would, was that all Confederates would be pardoned except for high-ranking Confederate leaders. Okay, so the generals uh, and the uh, presidents, president of the Confederacy, the uh, major policy decision holders uh, in the Confederacy, those government officials, they would not be pardoned, and neither would major Confederate generals, but the rest of everybody in the Confederacy would be pardoned. The, the sol common soldier who fought, they would all be pardoned, and a state could be readmitted to the Union if 10% of the voters would swear allegiance to the Union. Okay, so if you're in South Carolina, you need 10% of your South Carolinian population. If they come together, they vote and swear their allegiance to the Union. South Carolina can be readmitted to the Union, right? This is why Lincoln's plan is called the 10% plan. It was very lenient. It was very kind, right? Here you have these, these foreign operatives in rebellion to your country, and you're saying, for the sake of our Union, if 10% of you will just swear allegiance, right? 90% of you can still vehemently hate us. 90% of you can still be absolutely opposed to the union. If 10% will, will vow allegiance, your state can return. And for the radical Republicans of the time, again, these are not your modern day Republicans. Okay, we'll take a look at what, what it means to be a radical Republican uh, in a little bit, right? But this Congress under these radical Republicans considered this plan to be far too lenient. Uh, they, want, they want a plan that destroys the political power of former slaveholders. They are looking to not just allow these people back in, they want to absolutely crush them 
right? They want to bring them back into the union uh, kicking and screaming, right? They want to crush them. Uh, they want their political power diminished. They want full citizen and suffrage for African Americans. They want this guarantee, right? They want the process to be that in order to come back into the union, you have to give citizenship to slaves, former slaves, and you have to give them the right to vote, right? So Lincoln's plan, right? All Confederates pardoned except high-ranking Confederate leaders like Jefferson Davis, uh, uh, Robert E. Lee, and then the rest of the states could, the rest of the state could be admitted as long as they could get 10%, right? But now let's look at Johnson, right? So Johnson was vice president. He becomes president when he his assassinate the assassination to, uh, attempt on his life is failed, but Lincoln's is, is successful, right? He is now president. And immediately, Johnson's goal is to return the U.S. to the status quo of 1860 as soon as possible, just without slavery. He wants the nation put back to the way it was before the war, right? So you have a, an industrial north. You have an agricultural south. He wants all the people who were in power in the south back in power. He wants everything just like we hit rewind without slavery, right? That is his goal. His other goal is, again, Andrew Johnson is a southern plantation owner, but he is, his plantation is small. He's often overlooked, and he was not part of the southern elite, right? The southern elite didn't like Johnson, and so Johnson feels like this is his opportunity to get back at them, right? He is now in a position of power, and he is going to lord it over these larger plantation owners that disrespected him, that looked down on him, right? Uh, this is his opportunity to get back at them. He hates the planter class, right? Uh, and and this is his chance to make them pay. And so his plan for Reconstruction is this, that most white Southerners can take a loyalty oath to secure political and property rights, right? Most white Southerners will get to pledge this oath, and they will retain their political and property rights, meaning they can vote and they can still own property. He will then personally give pardons to wealthy Confederate leaders. Those wealthy Confederate leaders must come to him. They must personally beg him for his pardon, and he can choose to give it out if he pleases. The reality is that he's very lenient with these, right? He makes them beg. He makes them come and, and plead with him, but he says yes. Uh, again, it's all about the embarrassment, right? They just have to come and apply for them first, and they have to beg, right? He rarely says no. But this is his chance to, to have power, right? And again, the third piece of his plan is return states the union quickly, right? Uh, they must repudiate secession, so they must say that secession was never legal, that it was it was bad, it was never okay, and they have to refuse to pay the Confederate war debt. This is huge, right? These states have to abandon the debt that they've incurred. Right? War costs money. We've been over this. War costs money. And in or, under Johnson's plan, in order to join the Confederacy, or and, I'm sorry, in order to, to rejoin the Union, they have to, states have to affirm that once they do so, any debt incurred by the Confederacy, any debt that they pay, that they, that they owed for this war just gets ignored. Right, So the people who lent them the money don't get their money back. The people who invested in this don't get their money back. They have to just agree that because secession was illegal in the first place, that they don't get their money back. And the final piece is that they have to accept the 13th Amendment. Remember, the 13th Amendment has already been ratified in the northern states that remain in the Union. And so part of Johnson's plan is uh, in order to rejoin the Union, you have to accept the 13th Amendment. Okay, So here it is on our chart, right? Again, return to 1860 status quo without slavery. Most white Southerners can take this loyalty oath. Those wealthy Confederates have to come to him for personal pardons. They have to repudiate secession, which means they have to say that secession was never legal. It was bad, right? They have to refuse to pay their war debt, and they have to ratify the 13th Amendment. So you can see quite a few more steps than Lincoln's plan and quite a few more steps that are going to make the wealthy white 
plantation planter class angry. And Johnson, Johnson is going to is going to run with this plan. Uh, in 1865, he is going to uh, run with this plan all the way up until Congress starts fighting back. Congress and Johnson are going to have what we would call a schism, right? There's going to be a split. Uh, and it starts with the Freedmen's Bureau, right? Right out the gate, he tries to block the Freedmen's Bureau bill. Uh, Congress overrides his veto. Um, Johnson, there's a, a civil rights bill in 1866 that Johnson vetoes. Congress overrides his veto again, right? And there's gonna that the, this this civil rights bill is the first of 15 pieces of legislation that Congress is going to pass. Johnson will veto. And Congress is going to override his veto. This is a very weak presidency. He he vetoes 16 piece, 17 pieces, excuse me, of legislation that Congress is able to override his veto. Right? This is unprecedented. We have never seen this again in our history. We've never seen it uh, before that. Right? This is a weak president. And so, by the time. Right by the time of the uh, 1866 midterm elections, okay, uh, Congress is going to uh, retain a three-to-one majority for these radical Republicans. Okay, Republicans are going to keep a three-to-one uh, hold on Congress. These Democrats from these former Southern states, they're not going to get in as as much as they would like. They're they're in the minority, and Johnson goes on this speaking tour, this largely racist speaking tour, railing against the Freedmen's Bureau, railing against Congress, and Congress uh, responds by just blocking everything he wants to do. And so the radical Republicans in Congress, they start putting out their plan for reconstruction known as congressional reconstruction, right? Um, and the first thing that they do is they reject the southern governments. They reject the formation of the southern governments immediately following the war, right? These governments came back together. They tried to put themselves together. And a, a lot of these Confederate um, leaders, a lot of these senators and, and representatives that had been part of the Confederacy but were in Congress before that, a lot of them keep their seats. And, this, and the, the radical Republicans – uh, reject this. They refuse to seat these uh, leaders. They refuse to seat anybody that was part of the former Confederacy. And instead, they put in to play the Military Reconstruction Act of 1867. The South gets divided into five military districts, right? And the military is in charge of these governments until they are given the, the qualification that the military will remain in charge until the states agree to ratify the 14th Amendment, which we're, we're going to talk about. They have to draft and ratify a new state constitution that guarantees black men the right to vote. And they'll have to, as we'll see, they'll have to pass and ratify the 15th Amendment. Okay, So here you can see, you can see a map. This is how they divide up the South. right? These are the military districts. So the military is entirely in charge of these areas until these states follow these steps. Okay, this is again starting in 1867. And again, these amendments, the 14th Amendment, this is something that they had to ratify the 14th Amendment before they could rejoin the Union. It's passed in 1866, it's ratified in the Union in 1868. And the 14th Amendment calls for birthright citizenship and naturalization. So you are a citizen if you were born here or naturalized. Okay, it gives it calls for due process for all citizens, equal protection under the law. And then you have the 15th Amendment, passed in 1869, ratified in 1870, which gives African-American men the right to vote. So here's our solution to the issue of whether or not these former slaves, what was their status, right? After the war in 1865, they are free, but they are not citizens. It's not until 1868 when the 14th Amendment is ratified that now these Four million former slaves are citizens of this country, right? They spend three years, close to three years in this kind of 
weird middle undefined state but by 1868 they are now citizens they are guaranteed due process under the law they are given equal protection under the law to their white counterparts and with the 15th amendment it will guarantee african american men the right to vote this is the congressional reconstruction approach they are it's aggressive it takes over it takes total control over these regions until they do these things right so again under radical Re Republicans plan they must write a new state constitution and they must guarantee the right to vote to black men so they have to ratify the 14th and eventually they have to ratify the 15th amendment all 10 states do this okay all 10 states do this and as radical as these amendments are as 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 bold as they sound there's holes there's holes and it doesn't take the southern uh, doesn't take these southern states long to find the holes Okay, these these governments uh, set up in the South, right? They're largely run by Republicans. That's who gets into power. The Democrats are largely held out of power in the South, and uh, under these these governments, right? The Democrats are angry. These white planter classes and these Democrats are angry. They are not happy about it, right? But by 1870, all of the former Confederate states have rejoined the Union, right? Uh, there are several uh, African Americans in power, right? They are running uh, the country, right? African Americans now have – there's now universal manhood suffrage. Uh, the uh, Republicans dominate the, the Democratic – formerly Democratic – dominated South. African Americans occupy 15 to 20 percent of state offices in the South, including one governor, three lieutenant governors, two straight state treasurers, three secretaries of state, two senators, and 15 congressmen, right? For the first time in our nation's history, right, a nation that we talked about in our constitution, it's written in this this disparity against black people, right? That in our constitution, forever ingrained is this institution of slavery. For the first time since 1787, African Americans have freedom, they are citizens, and the men can vote. And not only can they vote, they can hold office, and they do. One governor, three lieutenants, we just they 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 start serving immediately and the major contribution at the time for the Freedmen's Bureau the major contribution of these Republican governments in the South is that they immediately set about setting up schools and public education prison reform for these formerly formerly held slaves right they are they are reconstructing society in a manner in which the color of your skin did not dictate your future any longer until until there comes a point where the white southerners are going to reject outright these new plans they're going to reject outright uh, these rights and claims to power and they're going to start to reassert their dominance by finding holes, poking holes in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. The first one is this, this idea of sharecropping, right? A lot of these slaves are now free, but again, we know that land ownership is key. Land ownership is a major uh, symbol of power, right? It's a major symbol of um, of, of moving on and equality and here you have four million freed slaves they can't all of a sudden just have property right and so you end up with these poor former slaves who need to work and all they know that all they've known how to do their entire life is is farm and so they sign on uh, to the system of sharecropping this is one of the first ways that these these former uh, owner class right these former plantation owners uh, they find to keep their former slaves on the land, right? So to share crop uh, means that you you farm land owned by somebody else, and you keep a portion of the crops that you that you grow. So a, a significant portion of them go to the 
owner whose land it is, right? But you get to keep a small portion of it, a share, if you will, and then you get to sell it, right? Sharecropping, if we had time to go into it thoroughly, sharecropping um, immediately devolves into uh, what we would call de facto segregation, right? That, or I'm sorry, de facto slavery. That this this uh, idea that slavery is illegal, right? Um, it's 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 outlawed, but basically sharecropping becomes slavery 2.0, right? You have these poor black uh, workers who are working the land. They are allowed to keep a portion of their crop to sell. But uh, they have to buy the seed. They have to buy all their tools, their food, uh, usually from the owner, right? The owner usually would set up a, a general store. And so now at the end of the season, you've got to pay your debt. And so you have to ship whatever you know you sell your share for. First, you have to go pay off your debt. And usually you didn't have enough to pay your debt. So now you're indebted. Uh, to the owner of the land, and it becomes a perpetual cycle where you owe money and you can't leave the land. You're actually not making any money off the land. It's slavery by another name. As these Republican governments spread, again, this is, this is in that period of 1865, as we approach the election of 1876, something to keep in mind is that there had been this cyclical pattern of economic downturns pretty much every 30 years since 1819. And by 1873, we see the largest uh, panic that we had seen in this period. Inflation skyrockets. The people in the north become weary of reconstruction, right? It's been, uh, it's been eight years. Are we really there? Is it really worth all this effort, right? The people in the south hate it, and they're quickly uh, uh, vocal about wanting to overdo, overturn a lot of these reconstruction efforts. And we see this movement, right? This movement start cropping up about memory. And what was the Civil War fought over? And we see this movement with, that is called redemption, right? It's, it's this movement of white conservatives in the South committing themselves to ending Reconstruction by getting Democrats put back in power in their state governments, this redeeming of their states, right? And they start to change the narrative. We know that civil war was fought over slavery. We covered this last time. I'm not going to belabor the point uh, now. But again, unequivocally, no questions asked. The cause of the war was slavery. It was fought over slavery. But after the South loses, they begin to claim this idea that the, the war was fought over states' rights, that uh, they had this uh, – this, this, what is called the lost cause narrative, right? Um, this It begins this heroic tale, right? This heroic tale of the Southerner who uh, never had a chance to win the war, but they fought bravely for their way of life, that it was this idea that the South was uh, not just a region, but it was a way of living, and that uh, they had to preserve this way of living and this culture, right? Um, and, and they knew they were going to lose the war, but they fought bravely anyway, right? And it's this idea that these brave Southern boys just did what was right for the South. And as a result of the war and as a result of Reconstruction, the South not only lost the fight, but they lost their way of life. And to this day, they're fighting to get it back. This is where we see this fight in our nation today over the, the use of conf the Confederate flag and Confederate symbols, right? Um, this battle over the memory, this lost cause narrative, right? The South beginning in the 1860s, late 1860s, is going to start pushing this narrative of the lost cause, and they're going to start rewriting history, right? They're going to start rewriting the facts of what we know happened. Right. And this is when we get this idea of Southern bells and the plantation gentlemen and a simpler time. Right. This is where we get the gone with the wind nonsense about this beautiful plantation and the beautiful relationship and the way of life. And everything is just sweet. And, oh, we just want to return back 
to to the way it was and it's just not the case right this moonlight magnolias is a lie we know that it's a lie because we know again that four million human beings were held in slavery held in bondage against their will and we know that they're the ones it's on their backs that these plantations were built and run that if these if these southern bells had the life that they claimed to have had it was only because there was there was plenty of uh, free labor doing all of the work so that they could sit around and have these lives, right? This, this idea of the lost cause is just a myth. It's this fantastical myth, but it takes hold of the South, right? And this is what we still see today. This is why there's a debate in this country. There shouldn't be a debate. I, we, we looked at last time, we looked at the very language of secession. We looked at how these states all came out and said the issue was slavery. And yet, if you ask people today, they will tell you it was a state's rights issue. If you read textbooks still in print today in Alabama and in Arkansas, they will those textbooks will tell students your age today that this war was fought over states' rights, that they were fighting to preserve a way of life, and their brave boys gave their lives for this way of life, and it just could not be further from the truth. This lost cause narrative leads to the, these democratic governments in the South redeeming the South, as they put it, right, fixing it, redeeming it, they create this picture of a of a that 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 the South is in need of saving, and that it's going to be these Democrats that save them. We see the rise of the Ku Klux Klan at this time, the KKK. They're the most well known of the group, but they are by no means the only one. There were other groups called the White League, the Red Shirts, etc. And they are dedicated to using violence and terrorism against these Republican governments, against these Republican officials to overthrow these Republican governments and bring about the, the redemption in their eyes of the South, right? The KKK is in no uncertain terms, uh, homegrown terrorists. And we see the, the death, we see the rising death tolls of thousands of men, women, and children uh, in 1872, we see the Amnesty Act that gets passed, that's forced through the legislature, forgive Southerners for leaving the Union. And then in April of 1872, we see the Colfax Massacre. The Colfax Massacre is this conflict in uh, Colfax, Louisiana, where the uh, African American Government agents are slaughtered. They are quite literally massacred by a, a white vigilante group. And all of those people involved, they are all arrested and they are all found not guilty. They are released by the courts. They are released by the Supreme. The Supreme Court won't even hear the case. The, do, the massacre is documented by several sources. The, docu, the, the massacre is witnessed by several people, and yet all of the accused, all of the arrested, go free. This happens again in New Orleans in September of 1874. And we just continue to see these violent uprisings all the way up until the election. By 1876, by 1876, all but three of the former Confederate states have been redeemed, in, meaning again that they have democratic governments, that they are, they are no longer under the control of Republicans. All former slaves have been kicked out of office in those regions. And it comes down to the election of 1876. The election of 1876 for the uh, presidency sees Democrat Samuel Tilden running against Republican Rutherford B. Hayes. And what ends up happening is that these three states, these three states, Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida, 
when they send in their results of the election, they send in two different results. They have a they have two different governments in power. They have a, the Republican government, which is recognized by the union, right? And they have this Democrat, these Democratic governments uh, set up that are recognized by nobody but the Southerners, right? And so they say, we held the election, and in Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida, here are the results, and they get two results. And what ends up happening is that Tilden, the Democrat, wins the popular vote. He gets 51% of the popular vote. The electoral college vote is unclear because, again, they get two different sets of results. So who gets the electors from Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida? Nobody knows. They don't, they don't know how to count it. So in January of 1877, the Electoral Commission established by Congress uh, is made. It's filled with eight Republicans and seven Democrats. Why eight Republicans and seven Democrats? Because that was the split in Congress. The Republicans had the majority in Congress, so therefore they got the majority of the members. So you can imagine the way that this vote is going to go, right? It's going to be a party line vote. You have eight Republicans, seven Democrats. It's going to go the way of Rutherford B. Hayes. But in order to make this legitimate, right, again, it's a party line vote. Nobody's just going to accept a party line vote. You end up with these backroom deals. You end up with this deal that basically the Democrats agree to let Hayes be president. Hayes will take the presidency. In exchange, the Democratic governments in South Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida must be recognized as the legitimate governments. These Republican Reconstruction governments have to be rejected. And, and these democratic governments be accepted as legitimate. So the end result, all former Confederate states have now been redeemed. They have democratic governments. The African Americans that had won election in those states are out. We will not see another African American elected to the U.S. Senate until Edward Brooke in 1968 from the state of Massachusetts. Almost a century before the next African American is in our government. The next time an African American is voted into the Senate from a former Confederate state would be November of 2014. So again, in summary, you have this system of reconstruction. There's debate over how to do it, but in the end, Congress ends up leading the charge. You see the rise of Republican, Republican-led governments at the time. You see African Americans elected to governorships. You see them elected to federal office. You see the rise in education numbers, the number of schools being built. all undone by 1877 when the South takes back its state governments, it takes back Congress, and they put in place the series of laws that we would now know as Jim Crow. They implement convict lease systems, and the reality is that while slavery was ended in name, we see in sharecropping and we see in the convict lease system that this country continued to incarcerate, continued to hold African Americans without cause. And while slavery disappeared, it disappeared only in name to have these new forms of slavery, Jim Crow, sharecropping, convict lease, become the laws of the land until the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Make sure you summarize this in your notes, get this down.